Friends, what can I say? Joseph was obviously a better person than I. Let me say that again. Joseph was obviously a better person than I. I know that Joseph had his faults. But the story that we have before us has to be one of the more awkward family reunions in all of history. Do I hear an amen? amen. Now, how many of you have regularly scheduled family reunions? Raise your hand. Yeah. Some of you have scheduled. And some of you who don't have family reunions, there's a reason for that, too. <laughs> now, some of these reunions occur in the summer, perhaps near the homestead of the family matriarch or patriarch. Some of these may be over the holidays or perhaps at the birthday of the oldest member of the family. Sometimes these happen impromptu at funerals. Most of the time, these are viewed as occasions, yes, for celebration, where everyone is so very glad to greet one another. But that is not always the case. There are those moments, those awkward moments that occur on family gatherings when folks look at someone getting out of the car or coming into the room and that dark cloud immediately seems to descend upon the proceedings. Say amen if you know what I'm talking about. Amen. Come on, you gotta tell the truth here in church. Persons start mumbling, I can't believe that she came here. And look at who she's with. Perhaps we say, he finally comes to a family reunion? What? And he wants to be the center of the attention as always. And look, he did not even bring a dish to the potluck supper. He could have stopped by Giant and got himself some potato salad or something. <laughs> we say, oh, they did not have time to come to Grandma's funeral, they thought they were too good for that, and now they show up for this event. <sighs> mm -mm -mm. <laughs> My friends, these are the kind of family reunions that I have experienced, and I thought that I had it tough. That is until I reread the family reunion that is recorded for us in Genesis 45. Now that's a family reunion. For in this very familiar passage, Joseph was continuing the process of being reunited with his brothers. And oh, how things have changed over time. See, Joseph would have clearly remembered when these same brothers were so jealous of him. And the way that their father had affection for him, that they threw him into a pit and then sold him to a passing caravan of traders for 20 pieces of silver. They essentially discarded him, their own brother, for dead. Yeah, it's in the Bible. I can't make this stuff up. And you thought that you were mistreated and were disappointed by members of your family. And this is in the Bible. Fast forwarding through eight biblical chapters in a goodly number of years, Joseph had earned the favor of Pharaoh, the most powerful person in that nation, through his divinely given wisdom to interpret dreams. And Joseph rose to the stature of being the most powerful person in that nation of Egypt second only to Pharaoh himself. You see, Joseph had encouraged Egypt to save provisions so that when everywhere else in that region was suffering through a famine, they would have enough grain saved up so that they could just weather that storm. Now, here we come to our story. Joseph's father, 
also named Israel, had his sons go there to request grain. Joseph makes them sweat a bit. Yeah, he had his humanity. He made them sweat a bit. But he indeed grants them the food they need. And by the time we come to our Old Testament passage, he breaks down and cries, eventually revealing that he indeed is the brother, the same one that they threw away and sold for 20 pieces of silver. And as I said at the beginning, that Joseph is obviously a better person than I. Instead of inflicting any pain upon his brothers, it is he who comforts them. Think about the reversal there. He is now comforting them because they are so indeed upset to realize that this is the person who now they stand before. But he says, do not be distressed. Do not be angry with yourself. For God sent me before you to preserve life. God sent me before you to preserve a remnant on earth. So it was not you who sent me away, but God. You want to say, wait, 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 wait. That's not what I read there. But here we have these words as we find in this 45th chapter where Joseph said, I will provide for you for all that you have. Come down here and be with me. My friends, this is a response that runs counter to the way that our contemporary world has conditioned us to react. At this point in our history here in 2000, 2019, 2019, whatever it is, when we do not need to look that far to find persons in positions of authority abusing their power. Here we find it a refreshing word as we read about one who was able to view his role through the lens of the purposes of God. When we limit ourselves, my friends, to that which we can see, it can become so very easily and selfishly focused upon our own needs, our own feelings, and of those who are closest to us, those who look like us, those who talk like us, those who are in our same strata of life, those who are in our own nation. It is especially at times such as this when we need to be guided by the lessons of scriptures so that we can more fully see how we are to become ambassadors of the life that has been envisioned for us by whom? By God. So it makes total sense that our New Testament lesson from the Gospel of Luke is paired with this Old Testament lesson from the book of Genesis, from the book of beginnings. For here we find the gospel writer beginning this passage with words which are very similar to those which are found in Matthew's account of the Sermon on the Mount as Matthew has it in chapter five through seven. You see, both Matthew and Luke accentuate the significance of our spreading our love to individuals who are beyond those who simply love us. Both of them talk about the fact we need to love our enemies. And this is tough, my friends. How can we love those individuals who have nothing but disdain for us? But as we read these two gospel messages, we find that there are subtle differences. One comes in a form that Matthew, who was before, as we remember, formerly a tax collector, he writes, if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the what? The tax collectors who were so hated in that society. Do not even the tax collectors do the same. Now Luke, and what did Luke do before he became this gospel evangelist? What was he doing? A physician. We have any doctors in the house? People are afraid to raise their hand now. 
He writes, if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. Perhaps Luke, the physician, understood even then the reality of medical bills. They were high maybe even back then. I know they are high now. Whew. There is another difference in the passages worthy of our mention. Matthew concludes his section with the phrase, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, this sentence has caused many a pastor to struggle with a proper interpretation. We ask, well, how can one indeed attain perfection? So we said, well, you know, God's perfect, and we try to be like God. Mm -hmm. But I like Luke's words. He has words which can propel us forward in action. He said, be merciful. He doesn't say be perfect. He said, be merciful as your father is merciful. That writer Luke continues, do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. What is being alluded to in these verses is a new measure of accountability, my friends. We are called to be faithful in our actions. We are called to be forgiving. We are called to be generous. Why? Because we are assured that our God our God, who is indeed more faithful, more merciful, and more lovingly generous than we can possibly imagine, has been with us all along in our journey. And this God will also be with us for the duration. And do I hear an amen today? Amen. amen. Now, I love the language that the gospel writer uses to drive home the point. The words of that final sentence of Luke 6, 38, represent a practice from a former era. And they can speak to us even today in a way that we can clearly understand. I like these words. They just jumped off the page when I read them this time. It said a good measure pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be given to you back. You see, the image evoked is that of a marketplace and of a customer standing before a seller of dry goods, specifically one who was selling grains, flour and sugar, etc. Now, some of us may be of such an age. I know the young people try to say, I must be at least 100 years old. That's OK. <laughs> I'm not 100, but I do remember the days when general stores and even some farmers markets, you would go there and you would buy dry goods. And some Whole Foods, they try to do this, where you, you, you buy things uh, sort of loosely, and then you have to measure it out. You know what I'm talking about, friends? And then in order to make sure that you would get the full amount that is being paid for, one would indeed, you know, you have to take that vessel that you have and you have to sort of pound it down. You know what I'm talking about. And then you have to press it up. You shake it up. And then you tamp it down and place it on a scale. No fingers on that scale. No fingers allowed on that scale. And everybody laughed. They are of such an age. They know what I'm talking about. You see, the beauty of this phrasing as it comes to us from Luke is that it has all of us together in that measure. We're all shaken together. In this world which is too full of division, it is a delight to have this reminder that we are in this enterprise. We are in this gift. We are in this family known as the church together. Together, shaken together, 
in a way that allows us to maintain our identities but still add the flavor one to another. Now, I know we have some cooks in the house on this day. Who are the cooks? Come on, raise your hands. I know those of you who like to eat, you cook. <laughs> My mother, she had me cooking at a very young age. Why did she do this? Because she said, you want to eat, you're going to learn how to cook. <laughs> she was a single mother. And in order for her to get things done, we had to do things ourselves. And especially if you are baking, let's say a cake, you have to get all those ingredients together. You know, you put all your dry ingredients together, your sugar, your flour. If you're making get some yeast, you got that working in there too. You put all that together and you shake it all up. Make that work. What a language Luke has woven for us. And I'm also drawn to this descriptor because it reminds us that our measure received will be running over. It will be more than enough. You know, each and every last one of us loves a deal, my friends. Who loves a deal in here today? Come on, I raised my hand the first. Who loves a deal? If you think people don't love a deal, you should see the way that people act around the perfume counters of the department stores at Christmas time. My mother, with whom I just talked about, she loved, she still loves Estee Lauder. I don't know why. It smells a little strong to me, but she loves it. And when you go to those counters at Christmas time, and some of you know what I'm talking about, they have special deals. They give you, they think they, you know, they, they at least tell you they're special deals. They're not that good. But they said, if you buy this thing, we're going to give you a bag. You know what I'm talking about? Which has some other junk in there. You think you're getting something, but it's nothing. But that's okay. We love deals. So I spent far too many Christmas shopping seasons at Estee Lauder counters. But my friends, we have been given the greatest gift of all the best deal one could possibly imagine through the life, through the death and the resurrection of the Son, Jesus the Christ. The measure is so great that it cannot be carried just in our bags, just in our containers. It overflows to such an extent that it must be placed in our robes, in our dresses, in our aprons, so that we can take it with us wherever we go. My friends, the words of our opening hymn said it so well, that there is a wideness in God's mercy. Like the wideness of the sea, there's a kindness in God's justice, which is more than liberty. The patriarch Joseph lived within an understanding of the mercy of God, and so must we. You see, my friends, it's not about us, it's totally about God. And we are thankful that the love of the Almighty overflows to each and every last one of us. Not just those of us who are here in the sanctuary, but to our children who sang for us. They sang that message about God being love. That speaks to us. It flows to people here in Hamilton Square, to people in Trenton, Princeton. We need love in Princeton. Princeton's a total mess. Friends, we understand what it is to be in God. All glory, all honor, all praise be to God this day and every day. And let the people of God say amen, amen. and amen.